Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be. This is Damon Bassetti from the Design Lines Consortium, and along with several other staff members, uh, Dave Ryan, Axel Pearson, and Casey Holland. Uh, we're looking forward to spending the time with you today to talk about our second draft of our draft LED lighting for horticultural applications specifications. And uh, this is going to be a good conversation. Looking forward to uh, sharing what we've already posted with you and some of our more detailed reasoning and thoughts behind uh, the changes from draft one to draft two today. First, as always, let's go ahead and begin with some housekeeping. <clears throat> We're going to be posting these slides on our website, designlines.org, after our presentation. Um, we had over 130 different attendees register uh, with the webinar. Unfortunately, that's not quite so manageable for vocal interactions. So please go ahead and use the question pane <clears throat> to ask questions or make comments as we're going throughout the day or throughout our webinar. Um, Dave Ryan will be managing that questions pane, answering stuff uh, via written means, and then vocally surfacing anything that he thinks uh, uh, deserves a little bit more discussion uh, amongst us here. Uh, as a reminder, and this is not the last time you're going to see this date on our presentation today, but uh, we're in a shortened comment period for draft two, and we need your comments back by the end of the day on August 22nd, 2018, which is 14 days from today. Um, speaking of comments, uh, one of the ways that we're asking you to send your comments, comments to us is with our comment forms that we've posted on our website. So just go to designlights.org, look for our horticultural lighting specification section, and then go check out these uh, drafts and documents listed right here and download the comment form along with everything else that's there and um, make your comments there. The reason we're asking you to do this is that with this nice specific um, location and the requirements, the topic, comment rationale, proposed changes, it helps us um, sort through the very large volume of interested commentary. I think our last round on draft one, we got more comments than we've ever gotten before on any specification we've worked on. And so doing it in this kind of structured form helps us stay organized and make sure that nothing slips between the cracks. So thank you. Um, here's our agenda for today. Well, I've already welcomed you, but welcome again. I'll be reviewing who DLC is, how we run through our specification developments, gonna review the draft two specification. Then there's some key questions we're gonna highlight or surface that are not meant to be exhaustive, but are just things that we think you'll be interested in understanding a little bit more of the story behind them. And then as time allows, we'll actually have a Q&A as well too. Um, just wanna reiterate that there's a lot of people and there's a lot of material. This is not meant to be the definitive uh, resolve every question or comment or piece of feedback meeting. This is meant for us to explain our our, our, mo our means of thinking and why we uh, chose X instead of Y for a given thing. So that way you can make your own I guess, written response commentary as accurate and focused as possible. Uh, so uh, get those comments coming in, written in the chat pane today, and also in the formal uh, feedback form, that spreadsheet I just showed you. All right, who is DLC? What are we doing? This is a thing I, I like to show people. Um, but we, we make tools. Stakeholders use them to do different things. Um, sometimes uh, I've heard people talk about, quote, DLC rebates. There is none. We make a bunch of lists, primarily that utility energy efficiency programs is the first customers of these lists to use to accurately, efficiently, and quickly administer their incentive programs. By doing this in one organization that's pretty small, we can uh, save a lot of duplicative work from the utilities of coming up with uh, minimum product qualifications, uh, performance verification, and this way everything runs just a little bit more smoothly. Um, however, once we have this nice big list put together, a really cool thing happens in that a lot of other people start to find value in these lists as well. And so stakeholders like installers, distributors, specifiers, even manufacturers, view it and use it as a good way to get a finger on the pulse of the industry, what's out there, what are the trends, what's available, uh, product selection, all kinds of things. And so in that light, we're coming up with all of the requirements to create a new list of aimed specifically at LED using fixtures for horticultural applications and all the requirements that would be uh, necessary to deem something as a 
minimum threshold for quote good performance. How do we do that? Well, we're not just a couple of people who just have ideas and put them up on a website. We have a very detailed development process. Um, if I were to summarize it in one sentence, I would say that it's a lot of talking and lots of more listening. And thank you again to everybody who's been talking and listening to and with us uh, as we work through this. Um, but we're, we go through great pains to make sure we're speaking with everyone who has um, a say in this industry, no matter what role they're playing. We categorize it, we try to come up with all kinds of different ways of looking at it, thinking about it, prioritize requests um, and feedback, and then we, we undergo our R&D process. One of these such uh, outcomes of this process was the, the fact that we are working on a horticultural lighting specification. Um, Thank you again, I'm going to say it again and again, because all of our stakeholder, all of our process of developing the specification, these requirements is fed of stakeholder input. Uh, experts across industry, academia, uh, utilities, um, all over the world um, is, is getting fed to us. And we really appreciate the time and attention that people are uh, giving to us as we work on this project. We think that you know all of us are smarter than one of us and that together we're going to be making a really good product. So right now we're kind of in this um, in-between loop where uh, we're in this uh, giving feedback and revising the draft policy. We've gone through one cycle, we're showing you what the result of that is, and now we're gonna be uh, getting soliciting this last cycle before we get to the draft finalization process and publishing. What have we done so far? Well, a lot, um, but right now we're between this last and second to last section here. The second draft is out for public comment. Again, it's closing on August 22nd, 2018. And uh, the final spec will be published in uh, October 2018, at which point the uh, new application website will be up and running and we'll begin to begin qualifying products immediately. Before I go too much further, Dave, is there anything that I need to address or missed or has come up in the questions or comments already? No, not yet, looking good. Okay, sounds good, thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and say, what is this specification anyways? So the last time we all sat together and looked at this, uh, this was what we showed you. Our original idea was to go on two axes of performance, output and application. So high and low output, full replacement versus supplemental lighting. Um, but we realized that it was hard to draw a bright technical line between <clears throat> a product that's meant to be a full replacement one versus a supplemental one. So we initially proposed in draft one to distinguish between high and low outputs and have a flux of 300 micromoles per second uh, that would divide those two. However, we got lots of detailed technical feedback from everybody, thank you very much, pointing out that just like it's difficult to come up with one single bright technical line between sole source and supplemental, it's difficult to also do the same for high versus low output. You know, one example that someone gave was, you know, a fixture that might uh, be designed or built to be a low output supplemental might look a lot like one that is being used for continuous um, intra canopy lighting, uh, but with very different, I guess, baseline incumbent technology that's replacing and very different application profile throughout the year. Um, so what you probably already noticed in the specification that we released last week is that we are, uh, collapsing everything to a single product category. Uh, this application seems to be so young and so new and so rapidly growing that we feel that putting up uh, divisions or categories or application designations is premature. And we want to simply have come up with a, a single minimum performance level of quote, good performance for any fixture that's LED based and meant to illuminate in a horticultural context. So one, one set of requirements, one set of uh, standards, and uh, obviously not precluding changing that in the future as we get more experience, both here at DLC and as an industry um, and as end users. But for now, that's what we're going to be going out and proposing. Um, like before, we are defining, um, well, photosynthetically active radiation as being the kind of linchpin metric here, the measurement. Defined by Asabi ANSI ES311 S640, this is the foundation of, of everything that we're going to be doing for a few reasons. Um, 
It is the incumbent measurement. Um, it is what facilities are being designed right now, and it's what uh, the legacy technology that we're looking at replacing, namely horticulturally focused fluorescent and high-pressure sodium, are all measured and deferred in, in time in terms of PAR. Especially when you're considering the utility incentive um, landscape and how those are calculated and, and granted, uh, apples to apples, not to get too horticultural, um, is really important, making sure that the baseline and new technology choice are being measured and compared in the same way. So for that reason, among many others, uh, we're going to be looking at PAR and using it as the, the foundation of everything else we're doing. However, we are not saying or claiming that PAR is the only thing that a plant will ever need, but it would be interesting to see if anybody could successfully grow a plant without it. Um, many plant scientists who have generously been giving their, their time and attention to us, um, you know, they've said very rule of thumb kind of casually, but even in fixtures that are making a significant X PAR flux decisions, probably at least 80 to 90% of total flux coming out of the fixture will probably still be within the PAR band. So, Let's go ahead and make that as efficacious as possible because this is going to be the, the, the photons that are producing the, um, the metabolic processes within the plant growing it so we can get food out of it. Um, but we also still want to make sure that we're leaving headroom in the efficacy requirement for what we're calling XPAR, essentially UV, A, and B, and far red light recipes, some people are calling it crop diversity. Now, there are real photomorphological and other effects that UV, far red, and maybe even other stuff can do for plants. And we want to not get in the way of experimentation innovation. So in all of these, we're balancing the tension between how can we make sure that we're being efficacious, especially with relation to incumbent light sources, while also um, giving room for experimentation. So let's start running through this big um, eye exam chart of a table. I guess before I start, Dave, anything else to address or focus right now? Not yet, Damon. Okay, thank you. Please feel free to pipe up and don't wait for me to ask for you. Um, first off, photosynthetic photon flux, PPF, measured in micromoles per second. You'll notice that this is no longer, um, oh, I'm sorry, I should have taken off that word cat category differentiated from my presentation. I apologize. But there's no longer that breakpoint of 300 micromoles per second. We're just going to be asking you to report it for categorization and filtering on the QPL. However, we also got a lot of uh, detailed feedback that we thought was pretty useful of also reporting, I guess, bins, if you think about it, in 100 nanometer wide chunks within that PAR range. So how much blue, how much green, how much red is that fixture um, emitting? More detailed information, we're going to be asking for that as well, but as a, as a useful first pass filter for end users or designers, um, we heard that this would be a useful thing to have on the QPL. So we're proposing to request that from manufacturers and to report that on the QPL. In addition, we received a lot of feedback about the usefulness of far red photon flux. You know, in particular, this seems to be um, a, a rapidly uh, advancing area of scientific research. And while the scientific consensus and I guess industrial consensus as embodied by entities like Asabi and other ANSI standards, processes go, there's, it's not quite there to put this into the uh, eligible for efficacy counts. It does seem to be of interest and importance to end users. And so we're proposing to both measure and report it on the QPL, uh, but not apply any kind of categories, thresholds, or requirements to it. Just to say, for informational purposes, what is the 7 to 800 nanometer flux um, on this product? Similarly, um, in, in more detailed form, we're asking for the complete SQD or spectral quantum distribution uh, across that expanded 400 to 800 nanometer range to say this is a flux of interest um, and let's go ahead and uh, get that on the QPL and so users can have one more means to filter and select for what they need, if they know what they're looking for. You'll note that we also restricted the range on this from UVA and UVB as defined by Asabi S640. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit, but the short version of that is that there are measurement concerns with whole fixture methods, and I can get that in a little bit longer, but to the point where we didn't feel comfortable putting that into any kind of uh, a reported or uh, published number. Finally, um, we're also looking at uh, requesting the photosynthetic photon intensity distribution. 
This is commonly embodied in what people call IES files, and it's the spatial distribution of, of light leaving the fixture. This is extremely important for growers and end users because um, as, as much as evenness is of illumination is important to uh, regular general illumination designs, it's even more so important for uh, horticultural designs due to the increased sensitivity of plants to decreased flux. So things like max to min, average to min ratios are much more important. And so we think it's going to be very, very important to have this within the PAR range, um, both on our list and publicly available. So people can make appropriate decisions about what fixtures, how many, and placed where. Next is the, really the, 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 the single biggest threshold value. It's photosynthetic photon efficacy, or PPE, micromoles per joule. Um, we relax this about 14% from our draft one specification of 2.1 micromoles per joule to 1.8 micromoles per joule. Biggest reason for this is um, we had incomplete data going to draft one. We were going off of 2.1 micromoles per joule, but it's pointed out to us that that was actually their lamp efficacy for uh, 1,000 watt HPS to blend it best in class. Whereas when you look at best in class of that type with reflectors with ballasts, Based off of data from academic researchers and doing our own research and speaking with expert parties in this industry, it seemed to be somewhere between 1.6 to 1.8 micromoles per joule. And so going with our philosophy of the first iteration or instance of a DLC specification for a category should be at or slightly above the efficacy of the best in class incumbent, we went ahead and went with this one. I also want to note that we are proposing to have a minus 5% absolute tolerance. Um, and that is for both initial qualification and for surveillance testing. So we want to be absolutely clear about what expected tolerances in these measurements will be as well. So this is what we're proposing. Next would be the photon flux maintenance of Q90. That's our, our quanta flux degradation off of the initial 100%. Uh, we're declaring end of useful life at loss of the first 10%. And we want to see that happen, we need to see that happen at 36,000 hours or longer uh, based off of uh, established flux degradation extrapolation mechanisms. We'll get into that in a second too. And again, that's for the four and seven nanometer range because as the, the power behind the photosynthetic reaction, this is the thing that matters to the growers the most. However, because we think that it's important to report on far red as an emerging aspect of uh, plant science and photobiology understanding, we are also proposing to report the time to Q90 for this band. Again, applying no thresholds or requirements around it, but just to say, well, if far red matters to you, here's how long you can count on the fixture um, emitting at the necessary levels to Q90 as well. Dave, anything to add? Uh not too much uh, that I think needs to be clarified overall in the group, um, other than to reiterate, uh, if anyone caught on the slide, Damon did try to correct this, but on the previous slide, there was a note about uh, the PPF output, um, and the column accidentally notes that as a category differentiator. That was the case in draft one, um, but that in the slide deck here was accidentally left in and forgot to be removed. So. We'll clean that up in the version that we post. But to be clear, the second draft, we are not proposing any differentiators or different categories. There'll be one unified horticultural lighting category. Hopefully that's clear uh, and apologies for the typo. Thank you, Dave. And the mistake was mine. All right, and as a uh, demonstration, this is data that we collected as part of our own market research. Um, casting about online and talking to as many different people who could give us data as we could find. This is a scatter plot of PPE as embodied in the world of available products from about mm, third quarter 2016 through about second quarter 20, I'm sorry, third quarter 2017 through second quarter 2018. Big caveats here that none of this stuff is actually we can't guarantee that all of these data points were actually verified in a lab. Some of these things may have been claimed without uh, third-party verification or testing. Some of them may have been verified, but to the best of our knowledge, this is right about where that 1.8 micromoles per joule break line will, will fall upon currently fielded products during the sample period. 
across all different uh, source efficacies or source source types. Continuing on in further spec requirements, um, warranty. We're still asking for a five-year warranty. However, uh, we did reduce some of the terms and conditions that we wanted to see in it due to the fact that it's being collapsed down to a single category. There's no more sole source for supplemental differentiated, differentiated um, uh, runtime limitations we want to see people honoring. Um, so basically, it's a, we're asking to see a five-year warranty without carve-outs for things like drivers or optics or LEDs. Uh, just the whole fixture should be good for five years. Um, we made some, uh, I guess, imprecise language uh, or statements about lifetime uh, on draft one, to which we received generous and um, thoughtful commentary back. You know, we use a phrase MTBF, mean time between failures, where we probably should have been using lifetime in terms of the full bathtub curve of system reliability. So we're going to be asking for documentation from driver and fan OEMs that that component, which is a life limiting critical component for a fully assembled LED fixture, will have a system, will have a component lifetime of 50,000 hours or more. And so we're gonna be verifying that with in-situ temperature measurement tests for drivers with uh, similar procedures to the existing DLC premium uh, requirements that are currently in force. And for fixtures that have fans that are on board and actively cooling it, we're gonna be asking that for that fan manufacturer to be providing the fixture OEM a specification sheet that shows that that fan lifetime will be at least 50,000 hours on the product. Um, I wanna thank all of the fixture manufacturers who gave us detailed commentary, especially on their fleet reliability of their currently in force and field the product designs. Um, one of the great things about working at the DLC is how open and um, trusting everyone is with giving what could be relatively sensitive information to us. Um, we're honored by your trust in us and we will always um, uh, respect that and, and protect it. And we're just extremely grateful for that sharing of sensitive information they did with us. Um, it did a lot to help ease some of our initial concerns about active cooling with fans. Um, and uh, we're glad to be able to reflect that in this proposed draft. Next are some of the more kind of nuts and bolts aspects of this. Um, power factor needs to be at or greater than 0 0.9 when at full power. Total harmonic distortion for current should be less than or equal to 20%. And safety certification, while there is no, I, uh, I suppose, final ANSI approved horticultural specific safety certification, it is our, our understanding that there is at least one pending towards that. And at, until that is complete, we will accept a horticultural specific safety certification for a light fixture by anybody that is designated by OSHA, NERDL, or the SEC recogni recognition process. Um, so that is to say, a fixture would not be able to classify or qualify with a UL 1598 listing because that's a general purpose elimination. But for example, UL has their outline of investigation 8800, and we would accept that from UL or a similar or equivalent uh, certification from Intertech or CSA or TUV or any other nationally recognized testing laboratories for safety. So we need to see a horticultural specific certification. Once that certification does get completed and through the ANSI process, we expect to require that for all new applications moving forward after an appropriate uh, period of time to make sure that enough test labs are approved and prepared and ready to uh, provide that. Uh, so we don't want to uh, cause any choke points or uh, backups in the testing pipeline. Dave, anything else to add or address? Uh, there was a question that came in uh, on the question pane uh, trying to clarify if we will be reporting whether a fixture has an onboard fan on the QPL. Um, and if that is not clear, it, it is our intent at this point to list that information on the QPL uh, so that users would be able to uh, understand that there is a fan present in a given product. Yes. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Finally, uh, revisiting power mode, um, we are going to go ahead and keep the, the, the sphere of eligibility open to AC line voltage powered devices only for this first 
uh, specification. Um, we are opening up to DC and power over Ethernet elsewhere um, in our general illumination and network lighting controls. However, with the rapidly evolving test standards, test methods, um, scientific understanding, the complexity added by DC PUE considerations, those that we're proposing to release, seemed like a, just a little bit too much to add um, on top of the existing horticultural, uh, I don't want to say uncertainty or unsettledness, but we felt like it was a little bit too much to add for this wave. We're not prejudiced against it. We want we we will open it up and consider it for the next uh, revision on this. Um, we want to get some experience with PoE and DC in the general illumination categories before opening up to the horticultural. Um, however, we did get some good commentary back about the status of, of things like remote drivers, remote ballasts uh, for these fixtures. Um, if there's a ballast that has a reasonable power mode that is more or less one-to-one -one associated with a the fixture then, and is tested and qualified in the same environmental conditions as the fixture, then we're going to go ahead and allow that as well. The specific language is in, the, is in the documentation we posted. We appreciate your feedback on it. Um, but the intent on that is to say, well, there's a 600 watt fixture and there's a 700 watt remote ballast. That seems reasonable. If there's a remote ballast that is 3000 or 5000 watts off of powering that, that's paired with that 600 watt fixture, that seems almost like a um, stealth DC system. And so we probably will not qualify that, but uh, we appreciate your commentary on this. Finally, um, spectrally tunable, this is a pretty young and new even for LEDs in horticultural applications. So we wanted to highlight it while also making sure there was good information for end users. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but um, instead of going, instead of requiring an, a quote all on or all channels on test, we instead um, are proposing to test the most consumptive single designed mode. So if your fixture has five design states, for example, whichever one is the one that consumes the most power is going to be the quote uh, I guess the, the 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 standard tested one, and then we're still going to be asking for isolated channel testing, so we can display those in the table in the QPL, so end users can understand the range of flux, um, spectral flux that they can achieve with a spectrally tunable product. I guess before I go on, Dave, anything else before I get into the key points? Uh, not too much on the technical side. There was uh, a question about whether the presentation would be available, and if anyone else has that question as well, I know it's a very common one. Rest assured, we will be posting this on the DLC website um, following the webinar. Thanks, Dave. All right, going on, let's go ahead and get into some key points that we wanted to get the highlight for you to make sure that you were thinking about it in the same way, or so at least so you're aware of our thinking about it as you're preparing your own commentary. Um, we're intending to allow multiple drivers for a single fixture. Um, this specification is not going to allow family grouping in the first wave, simply because the various axes of product performance make it difficult to define something that, what would be worst case for a family, whereas general illumination, probably your lowest CCT color temperature would be deemed in DLC's eyes to be the worst case, while the coolest would be the best case, just due to phosphor converted white efficacy, generally speaking. Um, that's harder to distinguish for horticultural lighting because the same form factor could have different chip packages or a few other variables. And so all of which is to say that there's going to be single fixture listing. However, we did not want to penalize people by saying, well, if you have a model and you have a standard voltage and a high voltage like 347 or 480, you have to list and test twice. We don't want to do that. And we also understand that some Manufacturers might want to have supply chain flexibility. If I have uh, off-the-shelf drivers from manufacturer A and from manufacturer B, I want to be able to qualify either so I can have minimum lead time or do some just-in-time manufacturing, for example. We want to allow that because that means we we'll encourage that because that's, that's good. We can get more products out there at a lower cost and accelerate the market transformation. So for drivers, we're going to be asking you, the manufacturer submitting, to self-test and document the worst case out of all of the constellations of available drivers that are that could go into a single fixture that you intend to ship, field, and supply um, on your own batch testing, figure out the worst case power factor, electrical efficacy, and THD current. And then document that. So you know, we have a record of which one is being deemed as worst case. 
And then once you've done that internally documented worst case condition or state, make that the product that you send off for third party testing in the certified lab. Um, we're trying to make this as flexible and easy and wide ranging as possible to, again, make the listing and review process as simple and easy as possible. One note, we are going to be asking for data with this to show that the driver can meet the longevity requirements, the lifetime requirements, at the maximum ambient temperature on the fixture spec sheet. So for example, if the fixture spec sheet that's submitted with the application shows that it's good up to 40 or 50 degrees Celsius, we will expect to see driver OEM documentation submitted along with that that shows that at the designed ISTMT and at an ambient temperature of this, the same 40 or 50 degrees C, the fixture would, uh, the driver lifetime would, would hit the 50,000 hour point or exceed it. Similarly, long-term flux performance um, is going to be based off of LM80 or LM84 maintenance testing methods. We did not explicitly say that we were going to use LM84 uh, maintenance testing um, extrapolation methods in our previous draft. We apologize for that oversight. We, it was never our intent to rule it out. It just seemed that it's extremely uncommonly used, so we didn't think to mention it. But yes, we will accept ex uh, long-term performance extrapolations based off of either device-based LM80 or fixture-based LM84 testing. However, we do need to see PAR-based or PPF-based measurements, that 700, 4 to 700 nanometers flux range. Um, we heard from a number of industry players that they were uncertain if they would be able if they have that, that PPF-based um, historical performance data on the shelf right now ready to go. Um, we are, I guess our, our first response to this was, hmm, you should probably go ahead and start doing that now if you want to use these eventually. But we do not want to lock any of these products out because of this, um, this, this requirement was out there in the past and there are probably very good products and very good LED devices that can meet the market need, accept it, the transformation across away from legacy sources. And so we are proposing to allow other methods to demonstrate long-term performance for the first 12 months of the QPLs um, for cycle. However, we're gonna ask for detailed technical documentation justifying this as well. So for example, if you have only flux maintenance in radiometric SPDs or in lumens-based data, we're gonna need you to give us a, a justified, technically justified, conversion factor to move that over to PPF and then put it through the LM8084 extrapolation processes. Um, we're not going to, and, that, and that'll be the only requirement. This will be marked as provisional in some form on the QPL. We seek commentary that is on that as well. Some of our utility members have asked us to make sure that um, that provisional marking would appear, not out of a, an intent that they would ban them from receiving incentives or rebates, but uh, for their own risk management processes, so they could be aware of uh, any uncertainty that they might need to prepare their, for example, regulators to uh, understand. Um, this interim other method approach will carry an extra fee because there will be extra review labor to go through and vet the conversion factors, um, but it'll just be the extra fee for the extra work. Um, after those first 12 months, we intend or are proposing to not allow any other non-PPF or PAR-based extrapolations at that point. So from October 2019 on, any application would require, would be required to, uh, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, would be required to submit uh, their long-term performance flux in PAR and PPF terms. And there would be a grace period to allow fixtures that qualified with these other provisional methods to resubmit and requalify, which is why I said earlier that if you, do not have this data or don't think you have this data, now is a good time to begin talking to your colleagues about generating the data sets. Um, like with the drivers, we want to see the ability to meet the requirements uh, for flux maintenance at the maximum ambient temperature that the fixture will encounter on this function. Hi there, Damon. So uh, there are a couple of questions on this item that have come in through the question pane um, that I'd like to address verbally. Um, so the first one is, uh, will humidity be a factor along with temperature in determining long-term long performance? 
Um, so uh, that's a great question and something that we've been wrestling with uh, as we've been developing these. Um, the intent for DLC is to, as close as possible, rely on explicit um, industry standardized testing. Um, we are aware of some of the provisions in a test procedure under development um, through ASABE, uh, and some of the provisions in that document do address humidity, um, but whereas that document is not completed yet, um, and even once it is completed, there will likely be some ramp up time uh, in terms of appropriate lab accreditations, uh, our, moment, our, our plan at the moment is to explicitly rely on the sort of IES uh, appropriate test procedures for a given characteristic. So um, there is not at the moment anything in the draft or anything that we've proposed to specify anything on humidity beyond what's in LM79 or LM80 as an example. Um, however, as the horticultural specific test standards are established, we do intend to transition over to those standards um, and they will very likely address uh, humidity uh, again, in a standardized way through the ANSI consensus process. Um, so that's the current thinking for DLC on that. Thanks, Dave. The, yeah, great. Uh, so Was there's there? a second uh, comment, uh, which is, it's, re it's really a comment, and given that it takes 6,000 hours to uh, run an LM80 test for TM21 projections, um, that 12 months uh, might be optimistic. Um, I guess one point of clarification there is that the 12 month time frame that we're referring to, and this will show up in a few slides, is 12 months from the point at which the program commences, right? So nominally October, um, not 12 months from now in August. But yes, that being said, we do re realize that it is um, uh, somewhat optimistic. And one of the reasons that Damon is sort of emphasizing here that uh, if anyone is uh, thinking that they will not have to do long-term performance, long-term uh, flux degradation measurements and projections for their LEDs, um, you should probably dissuade yourselves from those notions because that data is critical for a couple different reasons for the program administration, including for the utility programs to be able to effectively establish incentive levels. So uh, we are trying to balance the need for that data with the practical realities that may not exist yet. Um, but the fact that it may not exist yet, we don't want to use it as an excuse for perpetuating that it may never exist, right? So we do have some urgency in encouraging people to start those tests. Um, and then finally, there's a third question that came in uh, while I was talking there, which is, will the maximum operating temperature be shown on the QPL? And I believe, Damon, the current plan is to list that as a field, but check me there if I have that mistaken. I believe so. I don't have the website wireframes up in front of me, so I have to double check. But if I will check that while you present. Yeah. Other, yeah. Uh, we welcome commentary on it. But some some people have commented to us that we should put it as a additional system or product selection filter. Anything else, Dave, or should I keep going? That's it for now, and I will go look at the wireframes real quick. Sure. Thanks. So spectral tuning, um, I briefly addressed this as well, but you know, we received feedback that all on is not always a design state of a product. If you have three or four channels, maybe you, the, the fixture designer, are not ever intending for all three or four to be on at the same time. So if we were to ask you to do that, that would give an unrealistically pessimistic picture of efficacy and um, thermal effects. So what we are proposing instead, based off of that excellent feedback, is to instead ask for the maximum design power. So let's say that you have a fixture that is a has two states, one maybe for veg and one for flower. Um, and perhaps revealing my ignorance, but let's go ahead and say that veg is the higher power one. Um, that would be the state that we want to see evaluated as the um, threshold clearing state. Um, that one, that state that's consuming the most power. And so all of our efficacy, all of our flux, all of our flux maintenance, all the other stuff that we're asking you to do is going to get evaluated at that state. In addition, we're going to ask you to have isolated channel flux measurements, uh, not anything else, not efficacy, not THD, not anything else, just flux measurements in isolated channel states that we will also put onto the QPL so users can understand the uh, range of spectral uh, composition that's available to them. 
big question for you. Um, what that we want to hear back from you from what what's the best way? Obviously, we can ask for more and more tests to put more and more information about this on the QPL. One could imagine maybe even asking for efficacy at every single channel isolated or design state, but that's a lot of testing and a lot of burden. And we want to make sure that we're balancing that with the need to give end users useful information. So we welcome commentary on advice on how to balance that. We we think we've done a good crack at that in the current draft, but there's a reason we have a draft process and review call. So please let us know. Next is displaying extra information on the QPL. So PPID, um, that's the distribution of light leaving the fixture. SQD is the special composition of that light. And then uh, spec sheets is just general information about the fixture's performance. We want to build a good tool that end users can use to accelerate their transition away from high pressure sodium and other legacy lighting sources. Reducing uncertainty and doubt about what will be the best replacement for the products they're used to using is a really good way to do that. So we want to put as much information on the QPL as they can find useful to accelerate that. We're proposing in draft two um, to place some kind of information about these three items, PPID, SQUID, and spec sheets on the QPL, either the files and documents themselves, um, screenshots perhaps of key aspects. For example, if you could put the polar plots and uh, or a static image displaying the horizontal and vertical polar plots on the PPID of the product, almost like a photometric toolbox screenshot um, or of SQD, that would just be a static image file on the QPL that they could access and download and compare. Or finally, perhaps a, a web link, something that you, the system or product manufacturer would host on your own website. And if a user filtering through the QPL, sees it, is interested in it, they could click through to this link that will take them to a resource that will get them these files themselves. Um, we think making this information easier to access and uniformly of, of uniform work to get to would go a long way. So we want to get your feedback on good ways to do this. Especially, I guess, and I'm going to get to this in a little second, in a little bit too, but um, one of our, the, the big, I don't want to say fears, but one of the things we want to avoid is any unwarranted assumption from end users that one for one with legacy technology is going to be the default mode. There are fixtures that are on the market today that are designed and built to do that, to replace 400 to 1,000 watt metal halides one for one. There are others who are not. And given the relative cottage industry, some aspects of this field um, have experience working in that mode, um, we want to make sure that we're giving them exactly what they need to avoid getting the wrong thing, installing the wrong thing, and having a negative outcome, and blaming that on LED as opposed to blaming that on oh, my application design was off because the PPID was off or I wasn't getting the right spectrum that I needed. So we want to make sure that we're, we want, we want to avoid any negative outcomes that um, stem from lack of understanding. Similar to that is labeling. Um, there is no standardized labeling scheme yet used for horticultural lighting. There are a few that we've seen coming out from primarily academic researchers that we've been speaking with. The image we're seeing on the right here is one of those. Um, one of the interesting things, and we, we imply no uh, endorsement or uh, encouragement of the brand name here. This was simply the sample label from the paper that was published itself. Um, should we encourage people to use this or another label? Um, should we require people to, similar to how DLC used to require uh, lighting facts participation? Um, one of the questions that we asked ourselves when thinking about this was we'll be looking at this label, for example, and saying, well, some of these variables are things that we are actually validating and checking against third party test reports. Some of these things are not, like, for example, lumens, CCT, and CRI. Um, is there an implication of those being on there, of us requiring it to be there? Does that then imply that we're checking the content of this label itself? Or is it not? Should we be checking and, and verifying that the content on this label matches exactly with the test reports that we have ourselves? There's a couple of like follow-on implications of requiring something or even encouraging something that we flagged ourselves internally, and we want to hear from you as to what you think about this as well. We do think that some kind of standardized labeling approach would help because 
not everyone's going to be going to the QPL and checking everything. And so getting something on a spec sheet or that could be thrown on the side of a, a product box will probably help, but we want to make sure we're doing it in the right state. Next up is an application review. We, we're kind of proud of ourselves. We're, we're, proud, of, we're proud of this ourselves, um, but we're not just making a new spec and putting it out there. We're, we're, we're building a new website to go inside the current application management system. And so it's meant to be as simple and efficient and fast as possible. And if you've never submitted anything to us before, then this probably will pass without comment to you. But if you are familiar with how to apply for fixtures um, or uh, uh, network cladding control systems, this is gonna be a bit different. And this is actually a desired end state for those other two, but because we're starting this with a blank sheet of paper, we can go ahead and, and put into action some of the ideas that we have without needing to change horses in the middle of a stream, so to speak. Um, so this is gonna be a web-based process. There's gonna be some validation for the products uh, or the inputs. Um, it's gonna, there's gonna be no more Excel file uploads of checklists or worksheets. It's gonna all be happening on the website with reviewer commentary and feedback and forth. And uh, we think this is gonna be really good. So we wanna see if what you think about this, obviously I'll have this one limited screenshot or any thoughts you might have generally speaking about um, a questionnaire-based submission as opposed to the old worksheet way of doing things. Next up is a relatively major topic, um, revision cycle. We, in this draft, proposed to have a 24-month major cycle. And by that, we mean a uh, major cycle would primarily be focused on efficacy, uh, basically giving assurance to the market and to all stakeholders that the requirements will not materially change for 24 months. Um, however, given the fact that we're also setting the efficacy at the just at or barely better than high pressure sodium, we also wanted to include a mechanism for doing a automatic step up that is both um, fair to all parties involved and also um, significant in uh, advancing energy efficiency and dropping the energy consumption as much as possible as the state of the technology advances. So one, what we're, we're proposing and really do seek to hear feedback from you on is this idea is if at month 18 of the 24 month cycle, DLC goes into its database, figures out that efficacy number at which 15% of listed products are below it and 85% of listed products are above it and then publish that number, notify everybody who is both above and below that number and say, all right, at month 24, we're gonna go into cycle two in this case, and the new requirement for all new applied or new applications on this will be this new efficacy number. There will also be a six month grace period so that um, after being notified in month 18, products that are in that 15th percentile or below will have 12 months to update um, their testing. Uh, we understand that there's change happening all the time uh, with technology and binning and yield. So uh, we, it seems to us that 12 months is a fair amount of time for that notification to ripple through. In addition, we wanted to make sure that the QPL is keeping the data fresh. Um, we acknowledge that that is a challenge with the existing SSL product list. And one mechanism that we're, we are proposing to address that challenge on this horticultural application is um, even if a product does meet the cycle two requirements for efficacy, um, at some point before that six month grace period ends at month 30, the representative responsible for that product uh, receives a message saying, can you please confirm that this product is still in the market, still being up, is still being sold. And so at the end of month 30, um, one single drop happens in which all non-complying efficacious products and all complying products that have not been confirmed as still being on the market are dropped all at once. The nice thing about that, we think, is that then utility programs, distributors, suppliers, no one will be surprised by a product no longer being listed on the QPL. Right now, it can a situation can arise where a manufacturer working with DLC decides to go ahead and take something off of the QPL, even uh, it's just because it's no longer being sold, for example but all of the other players in that value chain, the uh, distributor, the installer, maybe even the customer, who's not quite found their rebate with the utility or the utility themselves are not informed of or aware of that. So we think that instead of having a continuous 
process of dropping these products when their eligibility um, expires or is no longer uh, meeting requirements, all that happens at one point in time, and then there's greater certainty for the rest of the time remaining of the list. Um, additional changes to cycle two could include categories or applications, for example, sole source, supplemental, intra canopy, or other things. Um, that development will be done with our normal uh, long stakeholder engagement process. In addition to that, we're also proposing a 12 month miter cycle that would happen uh, within the major cycles. And these would be things like um, giving uh, manufacturers a, uh, an, an easy way to update an already listed product. So let's go ahead and say you've made an efficacy improvement or a lifetime improvement. This, this should be a, an, it should be easy for you to get that information updated in the QPL for your own marketing needs. Um, also, where you know another example would be adding a unique private labeling workflow. Right now, the single fixture-based uh, system that we're we're building out will not support uh, a standalone self-service private labeling workflow on its own. Every fixture will have to be examined and tested on its own to be added to the list. So we want to make that add that on around month 12 in minor cycle two. Another example might be um, test format requirements. Uh, one example draft test format that might be useful would be TM33. Um, it's still in the draft form, not quite complete, but it does hold significant promise for um, easing and streamlining reporting of things like flux, of spectrum, uh, PPID, and uh, if that were to be standardized and widely adopted, then that might be uh, something that happens during a minor cycle to uh, make sure that going forward, everything is all done in the appropriate format that we are looking to see. Dave, I imagine there might be some questions here that we need to address. Um, really, I don't think that there are uh, new questions uh, that need to be addressed group-wide. Um, so okay. if people do have questions or you know, particularly clarification questions on some of the details here on the revision cycle, please send them in. Um, and we are very much interested in commentary if you have you know, concerns or alternative proposals on any of these kinds of things. Thanks, Dave. Um, and just for everyone's attention, we, we did post a lot of documents on our website uh, last Wednesday. One of those is an Excel file uh, spreadsheet in which we went ahead and placed, played out a couple of different scenarios for products of varying qualifications and performances through this major minor cycle. So you could go ahead and see how that might play out. And so um, please download that, check it out, see if it makes sense to you, and then send us commentary based off of that. Thank you. And finally, supplemental material. A lot of people have been telling us, hey, it's not enough to just throw down a, a qualified products list and set of requirements. There's a lot of people who are still going around uh, with foot candle meters in greenhouses, and um, we need to raise the overall level of understanding. And I briefly alluded to that in talking about making things like PPID and SQD available in the QPL. But um, so we're, we're thinking about some, some things, some one or two page guides or FAQs that we can publish in addition to the actual program material itself. So these would be things like, you know, what is a lumen versus a uh, micromole per second? How do those differ? Um, density, um, uh, PPFD, flux density. What is different and what is the same from traditional lighting considerations? You know, not intending for us to replace material like Asabi S640, but to point the way to those authoritative answers or sources for those who might not know to look for it. Um, we want to get away from rules of thumb and get people to doing this in a little more systematic way. So we think that we could serve a role as a good signpost. Now there might be ultraviolet. Hey, DLC, why do you not include ultraviolet in your in your requirements on this? Is that does that mean it's bad? Should I should I avoid anything that has ultraviolet emission? We don't want to scare people away from it, but we want to explain um, our current understanding of the state of metrology of whole fixtures on this, the challenges with moving mirror or spherical integration of wavelengths in that range. And if it is important to you, what are some other ways that you could think about doing an application uh, level uh, modeling? Maybe just doing a mock installation with one or two devices and then using a spectral radiometer if it's that important to you. And finally, you know, this is this is the big worry of mine personally is unwarranted assumptions of one for one replacements of HPS. There was a really good report that came out, I think, from the LRC recently that showed how if you are relying on that without thinking about anything else, then you might not be too happy with your results. 
And so we want to make sure that uh, people are thinking about this. Other things might be, you know, again, not explaining the full ASHRAE level HVAC lighting interactions, but pointing out that they exist and say, hey, if you're in a if you're in a predominant cooling climate, you might have one set of considerations. If you're in a split cooling and heating climate, you might have other considerations off of going from legacy tech to LED for your growing facility. And here are some, you know, this we've alerted you that this problem exists or these issues exist. And here's where you should go to, to understand a little bit more and make sure you're you're doing everything right the, the way you should. So we want to make sure that we're not stepping out of our wheelhouse though. So we welcome commentary from you and should we do this? If so, what should these be based off of? Who should we be looking to as guides? Um, you know, it's really important to us to, if we're pointing to somebody to make sure that they're a kind of impartial external leader. Um, so what are you know, third party nonprofits or kind of best, best practices orgs um, who we can work with to get this material out there? I'm gonna go ahead and go through the summary real quick to ref refresh everyone's memory on dates and times. And then Dave, we can open up for any last minute questions. So we had draft one, go out in April, it closed. We had a great meeting last month in Boston, talked a lot about horticultural topics. Thank you to everyone who um, attended our discussion session there and our panel. Um, we've entered your commentary and feedback into our draft feedback for this final uh, round. And uh, last week, second draft went out in October 2018, spec will be published and qualification will begin. If you have any questions, please email David and I at info at designlines.org. Dave, what questions do we have left that we can address in our three and a half minutes? Great. So I'm sure that now we're at the end of the presentation. There may be a couple new ones that come in, um, but the only one that came in between the last time I chimed in and now was a question specifically about uh, IP rating requirements. Um, I did. Um, respond to that question so that all could see it in the question pane. Um, but to address it verbally and on point, um, this draft, we're not proposing anything specific in terms of IP ratings or IP requirements. Um, the current thought there is that um, safety organizations uh, are likely building in, uh, you know, dust infiltration, water infiltration um, considerations into their safety, horticultural specific safety certifications as needed, um, and therefore for we would defer to those judgments. If anyone thinks that that approach is um, you know, insufficient or should be approached a different way, we'd certainly um, like alternative proposals to come in through the comment process. All right, so uh, a couple more are coming in. It'll take me a minute to read them here. Okay, so there's a question um, on how the horticultural specification relates to other things in um, the SSL program for DLC. Um, you know, functionally here, uh, I think it's easiest to think about the horticultural lighting spec and QPL and eventual submission system as an independent entity from the SSL system. We're not using the same metrics there be a slightly different intake process. We're verifying things a little bit differently. So there is another webinar tomorrow um, from one o'clock to two o'clock Eastern that talks about the other 4.4 items. So DCPOE, field adjustable light output, field adjustable distribution. Um, but those are uh, in many ways sort of modular and therefore separated in the discussion from horticultural lighting. So today's webinar is really specifically talking about horticultural lighting. Uh, there are some comments on the proposed PPE value um, and the uh, the type of barrier that that presents um, to manufacturers. Uh, I think those are best characterized as comments. So uh, the comments are appreciated. Um, we would you know encourage you to write them in in the comment period. Um, but for clarification purposes. Uh, you're reading it correctly. The proposed draft to PPE threshold is 1.8 um, for all luminaire types. Uh, there's a question on whether DLC has considered a premium category um, for horticultural lighting. Damon, you want to take a crack at that or would you like me to workshop it? 
I'm sorry, can you say that again, Dave? I'm, I, my attention uh, temporarily lapsed. I apologize. Um, do you want to address questions about whether DLC will be creating a premium category uh, for horticultural lighting? Thank you, Dave. Um, potentially, um, we will probably incorporate that as part of like the major or minor revision cycle. I think right now it's it would be difficult for us to say um, what would be that point at which the premium threshold is set in terms of percentiles of total products in the list. Um, I think premium actually, the creation of premium predates me, but Dave, is it not, is it accurate to say that in setting that premium threshold for efficacy and general illumination, there was some percentile of, of products on the list that was calculated off of the data, existing data? Yeah, that's correct. And I think similar to some questions um, on a different topic, but uh, it's the, the questions about whether we're going to allow DC or POE products. I think um, part of the thought process here is that you know, the, the utility programs, energy efficiency programs are still establishing what their programs are going to look like, how the DLC QPL will be a tool within those programs. And so until or unless there is both consensus on what actually makes a product a premium product, um, because again, there's um, understood uh, challenges in exactly what the metrics are. Um, there's a lot of concern about PAR as the only differentiator, for example. Um, but both so development on the consensus on the science or you know application side, but then also how programs would run it. Um, the current thought is it wouldn't be in this first draft, but certainly if there are differentiators between products on the list that meet the minimum threshold, that could be further differentiated into you know even higher quality products and sort of acceptable quality, but not at the top of the end of the range. Um, that could be considered for future development. So it's a long-winded response. It's not planned as part of the first draft. But it would certainly be a consideration as the whole program evolves. We're definitely thinking about it. Um, we would feel a lot better about doing it once we have a nice big set of data of currently fielded products because um, doing off of our currently existing understanding of it uh, without a lot of verification or, or feeling of certainty into the data that we have right now seems like it would be unwarranted. But um, yeah, definitely a thing that's on our minds. So the next question here uh, is whether there will be a provision for including or reporting um, for uh, networked horticultural lighting, um, so crossovers between a network lighting control um, and a horticultural lighting system. Uh, at the moment, that is not in the draft um, that we published for uh, this release. Um, Damon, I don't know if there's any other commentary you want to have on that. Uh, so anything definitive might be premature, but we are aware of um, the potential for doing network controls on these products, and it's something that we're going to be um, thinking about closely post-launch to see uh, what would be appropriate to add both on the SS or on the fixture-based horticultural list and what kind of other adaptations might be necessary on the network lighting controls qualifications themselves as well. All right, we are slightly past our time, but um, once more, thank you to everyone on this call. I know you have, many of you have generously given many hours to Dave and I and others doing our research and workshopping ideas and possibilities and checking checking theories and doing all kinds of wonderfully collegial work and we, we appreciate it. Um, we wouldn't be getting this far if it wasn't for you and uh, we look forward to working with you some more. Please go to our website, get the draft documents, uh, get the comment form, get the proposed uh, revision cycle schedule, and get us all your comments back by August 22nd. Email them to info at designlist.org, and we will get you into the consideration. Uh, metaphor is failing me, but we'll take under consideration, and we'll work on making the best possible requirements for you uh, for release in October. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate it, and have a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks, all.